the Newport Jane Doe, identified as Mildred Allison Huberts. Before we dig into the next case, I want to say something about a comment I got on a video. It brings up some important things, and actually I would like feedback from you all that may change how I present these cases. It brought up two very important points, in my opinion, and one of them comes up pretty frequently. I'm going to read most of the comment, and I beg you guys not to go searching for whoever left this. Also, don't attack or say anything negative about the person. It's not about that. I just want to address what was said because I think it's important. And one part of it I can shed light on professionally. Here is the comment itself. You regularly blame the cops because people are dying while wandering about with no ID at a time when no internet or organizations existed to easily look for missing people. Your ignorance of what life is like before 1990 is breathtaking. Paper files routinely went missing back in the day because they were misfiled. She then goes on to explain about something she knew of being misfiled and the fact that they're filed in a large space in a warehouse and that the reports date back 50 years, which is, of course, all true, stating and closing that my ignorance is annoying. So the first part of this I want to address because I have professional experience and insight, and she is way off base. It's essentially blaming someone for becoming a doe, and I feel like I have to address that because it's important. I know for a fact it's not true that homeless people are just choosing to walk around without ID. It's so much more complicated than that. I worked as an intensive case manager and the program director in two different social service organizations in the 1990s, which was directly the time that she was addressing. One aspect of my job was to help people get identification if they didn't have any, and I'd estimate probably about half of the homeless people that I helped didn't have ID. But I can't think of one of them that didn't have ID by choice. I can't even begin to tell you how often homeless people lose their wallets or purse or whatever when they're stolen from them, for starters. Others were kicked out of homes and not allowed to collect their belongings. And that actually happened a lot, too. And that doesn't even count those who had ID and were stripped of that ID by whoever took their life. And it just seems extremely unfair to me, especially in that case, to blame the person for their own unidentification. And at least it felt like it was blaming them. The thing that people don't understand and that I feel like I need to say is it is so hard for a homeless person to replace their ID. It's almost impossible. They need a copy of their birth certificate and their social security card to get the replacement ID, as well as proof of residency and a place to mail the replacement. Half of that is really hard. The rest of us would just take in a bill from our home, but they don't have a home. And there's a circular issue involved that's all intertwined where you can't get the SSI card without an ID. You can't get the ID without the Social Security card. You can't get the birth certificate without an ID. And you can't get an ID without your birth certificate. Additionally, they couldn't even get into the Social Security office to speak with them in order to try to obtain a new SSI card because you have to have ID to go in a government building. It's even more so now since 9-11, but even in the 90s, I could sometimes talk my way in with a client using my ID, but not always. It's the same reason why homeless people who aren't able to work have trouble applying for Social Security or even food stamps. You need that ID in order to do this, and it's all wrapped up in each other. So what felt to me like blaming the people for not having identification is just really unfair and often not at all true but it's not something that someone might know without having experience in that area. Now, the other part aside, and the thing that I want you guys to tell me what you think, and that involves how I address the police in my videos. This isn't my first criticism regarding this and regarding how I address their activity or non-activity as I see it. And it depends on the case, obviously. It's certainly not true that I have an ignorance about filing in the 90s. I lived it. I just don't think that's an excuse for it's often not even a piece of paper. We're talking an entire file. But of course, random missing person reports are probably even harder. But these are people's lives. I just personally don't think it's an excuse. And I thought I was pretty much balancing saying when they worked a case hard and on the flip side when they've made mistakes. And of course, the ones that we encounter are the ones that often had a lot of mistakes. But we see a lot where the police were working hard. They give them nicknames 
Often they even pay themselves in order to bury someone and give them a headstone. So I am certainly not blaming all police for what went on. I thought I was taking it case by case and trying to be fair, but clearly it's not seen as fair by a lot of people. Not just the person that commented here, but others. Now, of course, back then, at a lot of time, the police refused to take missing person reports, saying that a person had a right to disappear, which is unfortunate when that person was actually a John or Jane Doe, and that missing person report is the one thing that would have identified them. So I do think that that is a problem. But it's not one jurisdiction. It's across the whole United States. I'm not sure how it was handled in other countries, but here it definitely was a problem. My problem with that is it led to decades of no identification for multiple people. But that's not the only thing that happened. Bones of decedents have been found in storage at a university or inside of a police storage facility. There are actual people stuffed in boxes that are forgotten, and I don't think that's okay. There's over a dozen cases I've covered where they can't do DNA because no one marked where the person was buried, or they weren't buried in the spot they were supposed to be in. In one recent identification, the jurisdiction had no idea the man even existed. A veteran was cleaning grave markers and found it and inquired about it multiple times. The first time didn't even make a difference. But he pushed and pushed, and because of him, that man was identified. So I don't know how many of these cases there are, but I think it is a problem when people are forgotten. I just do. Now, if it's offensive that I'm saying these things, I can try to hold back. I'm totally fine with that, and I can pull back how I do it. My problem is just that real families are stuck in limbo because somebody didn't do their job in a way that other jurisdictions still managed to do so despite the year someone was found or went missing. Not to mention, in the 90s, we had databases. It was probably DOS-based, but we had them. It was possible to keep track of reports that way. That's also not an excuse in my mind. So if my judgmental honesty about what I feel was wrong is bothering a lot of people, please just leave a comment and I will do everything I can not to discuss it in this way anymore, if it's that offensive. It, of course, depends on what people want. I certainly don't want to offend anyone. All right, here we go again. The Newport Jane Doe identified as Mildred Allison Huberts. 59-year-old Mildred Huberts was living in St. Ignatius in the state of Montana. As many know, my state is really large, but it's not highly populated. We just first reached over a million people not all that long ago, so many of the towns are small, and St. Ignatius is one of those. In 1968, it had less than 800 people in it, and it hasn't grown much since. However, it's about 40 miles away from Missoula, and Missoula is a good-sized town. Additionally, these towns are all located on the highway on the way to Seattle. I've driven it myself, so in the interest of painting a picture, I will say that the highway goes through Missoula, then through Idaho, and on into Washington, and it is stunningly beautiful. The fact that Mildred traveled this road much less how it was traveled, however, is a mystery. Over a decade would pass before there was even a clue on this case. Fourteen years later, in November of 1982, hunters would find a skull near Newport, Washington, and this is about a four-hour drive from her small town of St. Ignatius, Montana, where she went missing. The location of where she was found was outside the town of Newport, in a remote wooded area, and that community also is pretty small. It's reported that her remains were examined by multiple agencies over the years, but they really had no way of knowing it was her. The undersheriff for Penn Oriel County would share that in the years that followed, after finding her, the case just remained cold. And this is part where I asked the questions before about what I say. In this case, it was a problem that they don't even know what was done on the case, as what was quoted as being a far less extensive record-keeping process by the sheriff and coroner's office at the time. So they were open that a lot wasn't written down or covered. So they don't even know if or how it was investigated. They would go on to explain that the skull was placed in a box and stored away. It went completely unknown until Under Sheriff Mike Kress discovered it in 1999. And this is just yet another one of somebody found in a box, and that bothers me to no end. 
He had no idea what the circumstances even were of the discovery. He dug and dug, trying to discover where the skull came from and what had been done regarding it. But much to his credit, he kept digging. And in March of 2017, county officials would send this to a Washington state forensic anthropologist. And they were hoping to obtain a DNA sample. We know this wasn't the first time the skull was examined. It was definitely examined in 1982 also. But of course, back then, DNA wasn't even a thing. It appears it may have been examined again in 1988. We do know that in 1982, they determined it had likely belonged to a female of Eastern European descent. The first exam estimated her to be 30 to 40, and they believe she'd been there between a month and six years. The 1988 examination said she was 27 to 30, 5'5 five five to 5'10, five and had blonde or dishwater blonde hair, saying she was right-handed and had been there for one to five years. I have no idea how tall she was in truth, or even how they estimated that with just a skull. Possible it's not accurate at all. With what we do know, those early estimates were pretty wrong. She was nearly twice as old as the estimate, and had been there about three times as long as they thought. That said, a lot of the examinations are pretty close. So it all depends, I think, on the knowledge and training of the person doing the estimate, and perhaps, of course, the condition of the remains. Unfortunately, after this examination, her remains were entirely lost. It's unknown exactly how her skull got lost in the shuffle of things, but thankfully it was found again in 2017. This is a pretty good example of why I wanted to ask how people want me to cover it. I do realize that in this day and age, please get a lot of negative coverage. I don't want to perpetuate an image that's not true or to be unfair either. But I'm human and I have feelings about some of the things that happen. We do know that this case was finally entered into NamUs, which is the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, once it was rediscovered. They did all they could at the time to process and get her DNA and that was entered into CODIS, but there were no hits. In order for there to be a hit in CODIS, one of her family members, or two if possible, donate their DNA, and that's set aside in a separate spot to search anyone missing. And then criminals are also run through that same database. So without one of those two things happening, there wouldn't be a hit if she wasn't related to somebody. After the CODIS check failed, in came Othram Labs, who obtained another DNA sample. This one was suitable for forensic genealogy. And they uploaded it to two public databases. And in March of 2022, they would announce that they finally had her name. Mildred Christine Huberts. Mildred had finally been found after almost 55 years. She was missing almost as long as she'd been alive. In fact, her identity came about 114 years after she was born. It was her own great-granddaughter whose DNA would confirm her identity. They learned a little bit of Mildred's history in high school. She was skilled in typewriting and enjoyed sports. She thrived in school and she was smart. One of her favorite subjects was physics. I wish the story of Mildred was a little more complete. If more comes out before I finalize the story, I'll include an editor's note. My favorite part is learning who they were and what their life was like, but there just isn't a lot here. This actually brought up a lot more questions and answers, so if anyone knows how she ended up where she was, if she left her home of her own accord, why she was in a remote area, all of that needs to be answered yet. It was incredibly lucky she was found at all, in fact, because of how remote the area she was found in was. In 2017, the examination would suggest a wide, blunt object perhaps a rock or a baseball bat, had been in contact with her skull in the right frontal lobe. And this blunt force was most likely the COD. It's believed they searched the area in 1982 when the skull was found, but of course there's no real proof because whoever investigated then didn't write it down. It does appear that there's a conclusion that there was no clothing, footwear, jewelry, or anything like that found in the area. Of course, a lot of time had passed and it's possible things had scattered. They did indicate that a file was found, and by the way it's worded, I assume that's a fingernail file. They also found a flashlight, a watch, glasses, and opera glasses. All or none of them may have belonged to her. 
In all fairness also, even if the police had handled the case better, almost impossible that she would have been identified at the time. The age estimates and such were far, far off. She was far enough from home that it would also make it harder. This all also includes the assumption that Mildred passed around the time she disappeared. There's no way to even know that for sure. Cases like this are so dependent on people calling in with information. I know it's a lot harder because the case is older, but possibly younger family members remember something that was said. Anyone with information, please call the number provided. Mildred Allison Huberts was missing for 55 years. She was an unidentified Jane Doe for 41. She was found 185 miles, which is 297 kilometers away from where she went missing. Huge thanks for watching all the way to the end. If you are at all interested in helping crowdfund John and Jane Doe cases, I provided links to the DNA Doe Project and DNA Solves below. Both of those allow you to pick the cases you help fund. Thanks everyone for watching. Take care of yourselves and each other.